Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those gathered here. Thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you for the joy of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the peace of the Holy Spirit and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that even in moments when others are joyful, that there are those that grieve, and yet we know that we receive peace and comfort and security from your Spirit, God. Thank you for the direction that you give us. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you that you hear our prayers, so many different kinds of prayers, things as simple as, as daily duties, tests, jobs, health concerns, Nothing is too difficult for you. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we know where to take our pleas and our needs because you are so faithful and caring and loving. Pray, God, that you would help us to reflect your love. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I got uh, the pleasure of, of being, a, a, I, I say, plain police officer yesterday. Uh, so I, I went ahead and, and went on patrol for 12 hours, went on at 6 and got off at 6. And uh, it was a boring day. And uh, I told as many stories as I could come up with with the kids because they like it all, you know. Uh, but uh, one of the things that hit me during the day was just that some of the people that we were interacting with have no moral compass. And I was sharing this because when I work, I always work with a partner. And uh, he's a good partner to have because uh, we've had good talks before about the Lord and the Bible. And I was telling him, I said, you know, the problem with these people is they have no moral compass. And he says, that's, what do you mean? I said, well, everybody who does good things is driven to do good things by something outside of themselves. If we're only driven by our own volition and our own emotions, then today we're doing good things, but tomorrow we're not because we're mad. And then we're like a roller coaster of good and bad because we're driven by ourselves. But when we have something outside of ourselves to draw up our moral compass, the direction, you all know what a compass is. I know it's, now, now it's the new age, like we don't even know it. No, Google tells us where north is, and we don't really need to know where. My brother always says, I hate it when the map tells me east, west, south, north, because I'll just need to know, turn right or turn left, you know? <laughs> but in the old days, we had those compasses, and when we were kids, we always wanted one, you know, because the needle moves, and it always points towards north. Well, a moral compass is something that kind of drives us to do the right thing. And to be honest with you, it's not just Jesus. You know, there are other things in our world that drive you to do the right thing. It could be the inspiration of your parents. It could be great teachers. It could be a lot of things that you follow or principles. Or, or it could be the law. It could be the Constitution. It could be the Bill of Rights. It could be uh, the things that you believe in. It's something outside of yourself that you believe in that drives you to do right. And so I told my buddy that I was riding with, I said, you know, the problem is a lot of people today, they're just living by whatever they feel. They don't have anything outside themselves to drive them to do right. I am so grateful that we have Jesus. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we do have a moral compass, and it's the word. You know, I, I remember uh, this morning as Richard said something that really caught my attention. He said that, uh, well, I forget how he said it, but basically, you know, this is our moral compass. That if it's in there, he said, uh, if anything is outside of the word, if it's not really in there, if it's something that we're kind of building on, but it's not really based out of principles of this, then it's hay, wood, and stubble. But if it comes out of here, then it's solid, and we can trust it, and we can follow it. And I was grateful for that. And I was thinking the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is a moral compass. You know, when we receive the Holy Spirit, He teaches us, He convicts us, He gives us a conscience that is enlightened, and he, he guides us. And I was thinking fellowship. This right here is a moral compass. As we interact more with one another of like faith, it drives us to do the right thing. There are times in life when you do the wrong thing or you do the right thing, but what pivots the moment is you start thinking about somebody. If I do this wrong, what will so-and-so think? That's a moral compass. You're concerned that this person would think less of you if you took your moral compass and you went down. And so that's how our fellowship itself becomes a moral compass. This morning I want to talk a little bit about a, a story that many of us are familiar with. It's Cain and Abel. And you might say, well, why in the world would you choose a story? I'll tell you how I chose a story because it's, it's kind of strange. 
So normally I know by Monday what I'm going to preach the following Sunday. I, I may not have a title yet or, or, or a full concept. And, and knowing comes a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's because I know a lot of the struggles going on. And I think, you know, and I pray and I, I say, God, what, what, what do we need as a congregation to hear? Other times I'll, I, I feel dumbfounded and I'll reach out to others. And Tommy, a lot of times, I'll say, hey, Tommy, what, do, what are you kind of hearing in the spirit? And, and Tommy will slip me a, a little gem or something and I'll, I'll play off of it, you know. Or you may not even know it. Some of you do the same thing to me. You'll come up to me, you'll ask something, you'll state something, you'll do something, and I'll go, wow, that's it. That's, that's where the message of the Lord's going to come from today. But Monday went by and I... I, all day I was fretting a little bit because I thought, you know, I, I just don't feel it. I don't, Lord, I, I'm not hearing it. I, I don't know what you want me to talk about. And there were voices. There were people that said things. I didn't ask anybody directly, what, what, what should we talk about? And I went to sleep. And uh, Tuesday came, and it was another day like that. And I thought, this is weird. And I started begging God. I said, Lord, just give me something here. I need something, you know. And you might think there's a million billion things to preach about in the Bible. And, and it's true. You could just open it up to any page and I could find a sermon there. But that's not the way I have chased it. If you haven't recognized in the, in the year and a half or a year and a few months that we've been here, um, I want more than just a Bible study. I want more than just a sermon. I want a message that... I'll go away and feel changed, or I'll go away and feel that the Lord has ministered to me and ministered to you. And so that whole night, I was tormented with a dream that I needed to preach about Cain and Abel. <laughs> so uh, and I would wake up, and I would be like, really, Lord? <laughs> Cain and Abel? <laughs> and then I'd go back to sleep, and then boom again. Uh, Cain and Abel? <laughs> and so... Uh, for whatever reason, that is uh, where I am today, and I will hopefully deliver it with the intentions that the Lord had. You know, the Bible is interesting because uh, it's this battle between light and dark, good and evil, love and hate. And, you know, when, it, when I was on patrol yesterday, I, I, I thought, you know, that what the world really needs is, is just the first, most greatest commandments. They need to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind. And they need to love their neighbor as their self. You know, if you just loved each other, a lot of things would change. You wouldn't have that angry fist at the intersection. You wouldn't have that fight at work. You wouldn't have uh, the person breaking into your house. You wouldn't have that fight that happens on the campus. You wouldn't have all this anger all over the place. You wouldn't have war. You wouldn't have Russia invading Ukraine. You wouldn't have greed and you wouldn't have jealousy. You wouldn't be concerned because somebody got more than you because you'd love each other and you'd think, man, I want the best for them. And so if we could just do those two things, we would be done, you know, with, with how to live the greatest life on earth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Treat everybody the way you'd like to be treated. And that would be it. That, we, that, would, that would solve the world's problems. Yeah. But we're not there yet. And... We're definitely closer to there in the fellowship than we are out there in the world. But some of us are real good at it in the fellowship. But when we get back in the world, we're like that kind of lizard. What is it that changes colors when you put it on a different tree? And you, so you put it in here where everybody's trying to be lovey-dovey. We're all lovey-dovey with each other. But you put them out there and you're like, whoa, was that the same brother I saw at church last Sunday? You're like, oh, man, they act like that? What a chameleon. You know, in Hebrews 11, 4, and I'm just going to hit a few verses in the New Testament that mention this, st this story, and then we'll come about to telling it again. But Hebrews 11:4 4 says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead. First John, he decides to bring it up in his letter in chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's interesting. Have you ever, like, 
resented the fact that somebody did something good? You looked at them and you thought you were mad at them because they achieved something better than you did? What do we call that? Jealousy. Jealousy is just the meanest thing. Jealousy and hate, they ride the, the same motorcycle. They are bosom buddies. They're partners. And when we begin to feel jealousy, hate's right there. Hebrews 20, uh, 12, 22, David read this morning, but I don't know if you caught the last verse of what he read in Hebrews 12, 24. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. So the blood of Christ speaks forgiveness, but the blood of Abel brought this feeling of vengeance, and uh, Christ's blood brings us remission. So let's kind of look at the passage and see what we might discover there in Genesis chapter 4. It's been kind of fun this uh, month, and I, I know the month just started, but I mean month in time, these last few weeks, because the sermons uh, have brought us some Sunday school stories, like we touched on David, Goliath, and stuff like that. And, and I, I never got the honor of having Sunday school stories put into me as a kid. Uh, Mike here tried to drag me off to church when I was younger a little bit, but mom and dad, dad never did. And so I never uh, had the experience of learning all those cool stories that all the kids get when they're in Sunday school, which I'll go down another rabbit trail. So when we were in the process of trying to find out where the Lord was leading us a number of years ago, uh, we, were, we were doing the church shopping thing and hopping. And this is before you all knew us, most of you knew us. And we would go to church and then we would have a sermon. And then afterwards, the kids will have gone to Sunday school and we would, as a routine of parents, Davey and I would say, so what would you learn in Sunday school? And the kids would say, well, we learned about Noah and the ark. And then we went to another church the next Sunday, and we'd ask the kids, what would you learn in Sunday school? And they said, oh, well, we learned about Noah and the ark. And this happened to us like four times. I'm like, man, you're dr these churches are drowning these kids in Noah and the ark. I mean, they, are they not worthy of a little better teaching? Are they not worthy of a little more rich uh, studying than, than the same thing all the time? And I, they, the, the, the knowing the ark thing? Yeah. Now, now it's a part of them. Yeah. They've learned it from 40 different perspectives. <laughs> so this can be one of those stories, and I'm sorry if that's the way you feel, but it's not. It's not that way. Um, it's, it's richer than what we may have gotten. So, starting in chapter 4 and verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from Yahweh. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a shepherd of sheep, but Cain was a soil worker. Wow, there's probably 20, 25 years wrapped up in those two verses. But the things that came to me first as I was thinking about it is that Adam knows his wife Eve, and us adults understand what that means, but she is excited. And the name Eve, which some of us might not know, is in Hebrew, Chava, and it means to give life. And I wonder what it was like for her. After having the garden experience where you've fallen and you know that you've sinned and your relationship with God has been broken, but in the process, God immediately wants to heal your relationship. He said, when sin enters the world, so does death. And at this point, the concept of death has not really entered. They, they don't understand what death is. They're Adam and Eve. They walk with God in the garden. They don't understand death. Sin has indeed come. And they cover themselves with leaves. And the Bible says that God comes in and he covers them with skins. And so all of the sudden, we don't know because the text doesn't tell us everything, but we find that covering yourself with the plant vegetation is, is not the proper understanding of how to deal with the shame you're now feeling because you sinned and you know that you're standing before a holy God naked and he sees you. He provides animal skins. And so a lot of commentators and people have come to believe that that was the first death. 
They began to realize what death was because God kills an animal to provide skin to cover their shame. And so this concept of, of religion really is born in the idea that there are things you can do in order to bridge the gap between you and God. But they've got to be proper. They've got to be right. Vegetation covering wasn't right. That's not what God wanted. It didn't provide the answer in getting men closer to God or dealing with their shame or their guilt. And so some way or another, he might have just, bing, created skins for them. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't really tell us. But in this story, we see that these sons grow up. And Eve, I'm sure, is delighted at the, the fact of giving life. Life, I mean, what an amazing thing that must have been for her to uh, give birth. The very first birth, this never happened. There's no one to teach you what it's like or tell you what it's going to be. It, it, there's no one, I mean, God may have shared a lot with her, but, but she still got to be the first one to experience it. And then to see that baby come out and to breathe that first breath and to hold it and to love it and to know this is life. And the joy, it was like participating in the creative forces of God. It's like God himself brought life. And now this mother gets to experience with God the creative forces of giving life. I mean, that I, I just, just because I've watched births enough times, <laughs> I just can't, I, I got a glimpse of it, but I can't fathom what that feels like. And I don't mean the physical pain or anything. I mean what it feels like deep in your heart to, to know that your body produced life. I know it's exciting. I know it's fun. I know it's uh, uh, bonding. I know it's like love at its climax. I know it's amazing. I know that a mother's love with her son is at that moment completed already to the point where they'll go to the death with one another protecting one another and that was Eve and and she got that that and and the word in Hebrew she she says I a, 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 a man I I I acquired a man I the word Kaniti is in the Kaniti that's where we get the word Cain she names him after what happened to her and she says it, uh, I it, later Hebrews today they use the word to mean I've acquired I've purchased I have bought and so it's interesting. She, she feels as if she has um, participated. And in this participation, she has bought life from God. She has, she has gained another life from God. And, and I'm sure it felt redeeming. Because, you know, coming back from the tree and, and that whole experience, that was, that was awful. But now she's been... In a way, she probably felt forgi she feels forgiven by God. She, she's like, wow, God, after all that we've been through together and the, and the sin that, that Adam and I have committed, you are giving us life. Wow. And it's, it's, a, it's a great joy, I'm sure, for her. And, and um, she has another son, and his name is Abel. And, the, and, and Abel's name is interesting, too, because his name means morning mist. He's a breath. He's a vapor. His name is almost prophetic because he's not going to get to live that long. He's like something that comes up in the morning and, and dies in the evening. Some of us that knows, uh, sorry, the, use it improperly. Some of us that know Ecclesiastes, where Solomon is writing his, what does he always say? Everything is but a mist, but a mist or vanity or worthless. That is the same word that the name that Abel is named after in Hebrew. And so there's something prophetic in the name, and I don't know, sometimes I think there's something prophetic in all of your names. Yes, and uh, it seems like a name rightly chosen is something that God gives, even though we may be the namers as parents, the uh, actual person who sees the beginning from the end is, is God. And so she names her second son, and they grow up, and, and Cain's, he's a soil worker. He is like his dad. He grows up to be just like his dad. A matter of fact, that's what God asked his dad to do. Be a worker of the soil. But, but Abel, sorry, Cain is the soil worker, and, and Abel is, is a shepherd. 
and he begins to, to really look after the animals. And so these two careers develop with these two sons, and I bet you Eve and Adam were, were quite proud and, and excited about it. And uh, we'll move on from there to verses 3 and 4 and 5. And in the process of days it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahweh, unto God. And Abel he also brought of the firstborn of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord gazed upon Abel and his offering, but he did not gaze upon Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So you'll see that your version doesn't have exactly the wording like that. Most of the versions are going to say God accepted Abel's offering and God rejected Cain's offering. But the word is gaze. And I think you'll understand this in a minute. So the two bring their different offerings and one captures the attention of God. I mean, have you ever had a moment in your life where you're doing something, whether it's sports or an achievement, you're building something, and somebody from outside of wherever of what you've been doing who hasn't been watching your progress, but they finally see what you've done and they just pause. They, it's almost like they don't say, it, it's like that. Wow. And, and without words, they've given you the best compliment you could ever have. You're like, man, they are amazed at that. I mean, it could be a car on the car lot, JB. It could be some guy walks on the lot, and you don't, walk, you don't work on the lot too much anymore. But if one of your guys was there, and, 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 they, and they see a guy walk up, and he comes to look at a truck or something, and he goes, that salesman's like, man, I sold this truck already. Yeah. I got it. This truck is sold. Because he sees in the eyes the admiration, the, the, uh, the idea that this is wonderful. This is good. And that's what we're talking about. This is what happens. God uh, is there and Cain is bringing a grain offering and, and Abel is bringing a, 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 a lamb or a goat, a, a, a small animal, and, and, and Abel kills this animal as a sacrifice unto God. And Cain offers up his grain, maybe burns it as a sacrifice up to God. But God's attention is grabbed, mesmerized, by Abel's offering. You know, at this point of the story already, some of us are saying, it just isn't fair. Is there anybody like that? I mean, I was like that. And guess who is also like that? Cain. Cain. So there's a little Cain in most of us. And we go, well, why? Why, why would God do that? Why, would, why wouldn't God? I mean, he was a worker of the soil. The soil meant something to him. I had to deal with T Tobin having this conversation with me. And he's like, well, why? Why is it like that? I mean, hey, that, that Cain worked hard on that soil. And maybe it was his, the way uh, Tobin worded it was, maybe it was his prized cabbage. <laughs> he did. He used the word cabbage. I don't know why. Maybe he's going to produce a prized cabbage. I don't know. And so it just doesn't seem fair. What could have Cain done at this point instead of being angry? Repent, put his face on the ground. <laughs> seek advice from Abel. So repent, ask what the problem was, seek advice from Abel. Yeah, any of those things. Was God trying to create an unhealthy competition between these two boys? No. But God has a certain way he wants to see things done. And you can do religion your way, or you can do religion God's way. Yeah. And maybe your way seems better. Maybe it, it saves the earth a little better. Maybe it doesn't kill as many animals. It's not as bloody and nasty and dirty. Maybe you got all kinds of logic for doing it your way. But at the end of the day, it's just about, do you want to do God's way or your way? Yeah. And so all Cain had to do was do it God's way. Wow, God, had no idea. Hey, Abel, how much grain do I have to pay you to get another one of your little sheep? Wow, that would have created a brotherhood right there. Well, the fact is, your sheep have been eating my grain. <laughs> and uh, we got to have a little cooperation here. 
and let's do what we can do to be a team in pleasing our God. But it became this competition. It became this, I know what I need to do, and you know what you need to do. And it became unhealthy, and it became filled with jealousy. The scripture actually doesn't tell us why Cain's offering didn't meet God's standards. It doesn't. We only know that God gave him a chance to make it right, and we're going to see that in the next verse. And he chose to make it wrong instead. Cain watched his brother get the affirmation he wanted. Then he believed the lie that he had to compete with his brother. He sees the affirmation of God and he covets that. That's what he wanted. That's what caused the jealousy. He, he knew that his brother had caught the gaze of God. And so the very thing he was lusting and, and thirsting after was that attention from God. But where he went askew is when he decided that by destroying his brother, he would be able to get God's attention. No, you could simply get God's attention by imitating what your brother did instead of hating him. And this is life right here. This is, this is, where, this is ground level. This is what we do. And you didn't learn this in Sunday school. We get jealous. We get envious. We don't wish the best of our brother and our sister. But we got to back up one notch on the devil's schemes. What is it that's causing us to feel that way? Well, they're getting attention that we want. Well, is that healthy attention? If it's God's attention, then correct your behavior. If it's the world's attention you're looking at, then you've really stepped away from pleasing your father. In Genesis 4, 6, and 7, it says, And Yahweh said unto Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? Just do the right thing, and I will accept you. And if you do not will, do well, sin lies at the door, and unto you will be its desire, and you shall rule over him. That verse alone we could spend forever on, and I won't. It's the one with the least notes in my paper. But when you do wrong, or when you begin to let your heart envy, or be jealous, or, or to creep into these things that, that pervert your heart, that darken your heart, sin is waiting to manifest itself. You know, Jesus said, the adulterer is not merely the person who commits adultery, it's the man who thinks adulterous thoughts in his heart. Jesus says, it's not the murderer that is simply the murderer, it's the man who hates his brother. So where it happens first is in the heart, and then sin is crouching at her door saying, act it out. Act it out. Bring out that jealousy, that hatred, that anger, that lust, those desires. Let them surface. Act them out. But... Even in saying this to Cain, God offers him hope at the end of it, and he says, but you must master it. You've got to conquer it. You can rule over it. You can get a hold of this. Once you begin to, to listen and, and, and to see and, and to understand the way the Holy Spirit does, you don't have to be captive to the desires of sin. Yeah, the temptations will come. Yeah, your heart will be tried but you won't act on it the same way. You'll be changed. One thing I noticed in my thinking of this is once, and this has to do with the moral compass thing, once a man rebels against his God, he becomes an enemy of his fellow man. We think that, you know, when we just abandon our compass, that we're just getting back at God. God, if that's the way you feel, then, then I'm just not going to talk to you today it comes out and manifests itself on, on every relationship you have in your life. Yep. When your walk with God is wrong, your marriage is wrong. When your walk with God is wrong, your relationship with your dad and your parents is wrong. When your walk with your teacher at JMU is completely wrong, how much heart do you put into the assignments that they give you? How much do you care? How much do you just give just a much? so you can get the grade. 
Your compass has to be right. In Genesis 4.8, it says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. You know, the whole thing Cain appeared to want was God's attention. He got it. Yeah. And he got it. The wrong way. Right. He got the gaze. Okay. So there's the gaze of admiration where God looks at you and goes, Wow, that's amazing. I'm so proud of you. Man, woohoo, look at you. And then there's the attention of God that's like, Are you kidding me? You did that? What? I didn't, it never crossed my mind that you would behave like that. In 1 John 3.13, it says, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Because we're on opposite sides. We're in the light. They're in the dark. The world's going to hate you. If you're walking in the light, the world's going to hate you. Don't be surprised. If the world doesn't hate you, check yourself. You may not be shining that light too well. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. How do you know if you pass from life to death or, or, or death to life? It, it's a, a love thermometer. If you don't love somebody in your fellowship and you don't wish the best of them, then you walk in death. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Wow. This is the Bible. 1 John 3.15, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. Amen. Let me tell it to you how Jesus said, if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Matthew 6.15. If you cannot forgive, you will not meet me in heaven. Or Jesus is a liar. You can make up all the stories and offer your grain sacrifice all you want. But until you pay attention to how God does it, you'll not get the gaze you want. We talk about Judgment Day, and it's a blessing for some. Because they'll be covered with the blood of Jesus. But it's a curse for others. Because they'll be covered with the blood of all those people that they murdered in their hearts. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Sometimes we're like, well, how can I love? And I think when we come to understand his love for us, that's how we can love. I, I hated myself. When I really spent time with myself when I was young, I hated me. When I thought about who I was, what I did, what I thought, everything, I hated me. And when I realized that God loved me, that was a revolution. I was like, how could you love me? And he kept just saying, I love you. And speaking that love into my heart. And realizing that God loved me made me realize, wow, I've got to love other people. How can I continue hating people if God loves me? We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must love their brother or sister. But, 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 but you don't know what they did to me. It's a must verse. And the last two verses. Genesis 4, 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. Lie. Yeah, lie. He replied, Am I my brother's keeper? Yep. The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. In Philippians, 
speaking about the love of Christ, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So Jesus did not value his life more than yours. I mean, we hear it commonly, Jesus laid his life down for us. But I want you to hear it differently. He did not value his life as much as yours. And then he turns around and says, have the same attitude toward one another. Don't value your life or think of yourself better than your brother or sister. Transition your mindset into a thinking process in which you say, I value what they value more than what I value. I'm going to lay down what I want so they can get what they want. And so when they have a victory, you're like, amen, that's exactly what I wanted. Wow, good for you, Abel, that's awesome. Did you see God's gaze on you? Man, God was fired up about your offering. Yeah, I don't think he liked mine at all, but wow, his gaze on yours was great. Man, that was cool, Abel, man, give me a high five. Way to go, dude, I've never seen God's jaw like that. Wow, it just dropped, you did it. Man, could I buy some of those sheep? <laughs> That was cool, Abel. It would have been different. And it could have been different. And our fellowship could be different. It could be even richer. I've seen so much growth in the last year. Really. I mean, we've been through so much together and God's grown us together. But we need to crank up the love for one another. You say, well, I'm waiting for them to talk to me. They never talked to me. They never even greeted me. Make the first move. Don't be Cain. That's it. <laughs> Let's pray. God, I love you. I thank you. I pray that you'll change our hearts. Help us to be more like Abel so that we can please you. Man, to get your gaze, God, that's, there's nothing like it. Or to be like Eve and to know that we've been forgiven as we see new life being born. Father, as I see new people come in here and be born again as they receive the message to repent and be baptized and, and be filled with your Holy Spirit as, as they begin to understand the things of God and they see your word and the way that you do things and, the, and the, the methodology that you've chosen. And I see that new birth, God, I'm just astounded. I'm just like, wow, man, it's amazing. I know that fruitfulness is your, is your gaze in a way. As we see things grow and flourish and lives change, Father, I know that you're well pleased with that. And so, God, I pray that it won't become this competitive thing, this jealousy thing, this weird thing like these two boys had. But the, we will be a team and we will root for one another as one building. As one building, building on the foundation of Jesus, building on the foundation of the apostles' doctrine, each stone being jointly fitted together in a perfect temple. Just lifting up you, God, giving you glory and honor. God, we all covet your gaze. We covet your attention. We, we want to be there with you. We don't earn it. You grant it. Father, help us to feel that love so that we can love others properly. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.